Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest has been a nomadic polyglot for over 20 years. He, is, he speaks over 10 languages, several at the fluency level. He runs the largest language blog in the world, Fluency Fluent in Three Months, which receives more than one to two million unique visitors every month. He is author of multiple books, has given a number of TED Talks, and is a National Geographic Traveler of the World. Please welcome to the show, Benny Lewis. Benny, how are you? Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Pleasure is all mine. Why don't we take a moment and kind of walk us through your backstory? How did you get into traveling? How did you get into deciding you wanted to learn so many languages? And, and maybe even how you decided you wanted to document it in your amazing blog? Yeah, so um, 20 years ago, 2003, I graduated with a degree in electronic engineering. And so no background whatsoever related to languages. And uh, I moved to Spain and I lived in Spain for six months and I did not speak Spanish at the end of those six months. Okay. So I was convinced I don't have this language gene, whatever it is. Uh, however, I had seen some evidence to the contrary other engineers on my exchange program who were picking up Spanish. So that challenged this view I had in my head that you're either technically minded or you're artistically minded where the arts includes languages. And so that meant maybe I could potentially learn Spanish myself. And I did a lot of experiments, a lot of failed experiments. And eventually the one that worked for me was very simply avoiding speaking English and to speak Spanish as much as possible, despite the fact that my Spanish sounded like Tarzan Spanish. And um, after doing that for a few months, I started to get conversational. And then I figured I really enjoyed this process, so I wanted to repeat it in other countries. And I have been traveling for most of the, the last two decades. I did stop in the States for about five or six years, uh, but now I'm back into being completely nomadic. And when I say completely, I mean everything I own in the world weighs 23 kilograms or 50 pounds. Wow. And um, I have no base whatsoever. Uh, my situation is is quite unique, actually, because I had moved to the States. I had gotten a green card. Normally, you would lose your green card if you're traveling. But I found this lovely little workaround where I have a special travel permit. So I can maintain my company in Texas without losing my residency. And um, I plan to continue traveling for as long as I can. Okay, amazing. Let's go backwards a little bit. Like, What were some of the things that just didn't work? Or, or maybe even let's narrow it down. What are some of, the, some of the popular things that people think will work, but actually don't work very well at all? Well... What had not worked for me already before Spain, I happened to take German in high school, Okay, uh, is a classroom environment. And because I was a very bad student in that environment, I had convinced myself that I am bad at languages. Yep. But all that really proved was that I was bad at learning in that academic environment. So for anybody listening who has had a lot of failures with languages in the past, that does not mean you are a failure with languages. It means your approach didn't work. Uh, I also thought maybe just like bulk overexposure to the language might do it. And so I was listening to Spanish. I even picked up El Señor de los Anillos, the Lord of the Rings. And I figured if I just read this all the way through, I'll be, wow. in, I'll be fluent in Spanish by the end. Absolutely didn't work. was a waste of time. I tried studying the dictionary from the very first word. So I had a lot of very bad ideas, um, but ultimately I, I always tell people that your approach really has to align with your goals. So I'm not necessarily saying speak from day one, which is, this, this is my philosophy, speak from day one. I'm not necessarily saying this is what everybody must use if they want to be successful in language learning. Mm -hmm. But if you have similar goals to me, and because I'm I'm a traveler and I want to interact with people, my goals are much less academic. I have no interest in passing exams. I don't necessarily do a lot of very technical things in a language. I'm interacting with humans. So that means 
you have to practice what you are ultimately aiming to do. And so I have to speak with humans from the very beginning. And every language that I've learned after Spanish, I have implemented this approach that on the very first day, even when my level is terrible, I use the the couple of dozen words that I learn that I know already. I try to figure out quickly what all the cognates are, the words I already know. Mm -hmm. And then I build upon that. People are patient with me. Nobody gets mad at me for having grammatically incorrect sentences. And I gain the confidence to express myself more and more. And surprisingly, you get to fluency quite quickly if you're truly focused on it in an intensive period. Well, and I think another important piece that you you said without saying is that your goal is to be able to speak to other humans. That means it's not like, okay, writing essays or or reading. I mean, a lot of those types of things can kind of come later. Like I've I'm working on learning how to read and write in Spanish right now. I, I live in Panama, but I think that my first goal was to be able to go to the restaurant and order my food or go to the bank and do my banking or go to the grocery store and like interact and make myself understood because, you know, reading and writing is actually a technology. I mean, that is a, a, a totally different set of skills than learning to converse with someone else. The other important point that you made is when I was a child, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. So they took me out of my normal program, um, you know, my normal school program, and I never learned French. I never went to school for French. And they just told me, Mikhail, you have so many problems with English. Like, basically, we don't want to overload you and languages are not your thing. Like, I got told that with my native language. And now what do I do for a living? I, I write and I speak for a living. So... I, similar to, to you, I had uh, an issue when I was growing up. I had to go to speech therapy. Wow. I had great difficulty speaking English. And yeah. my my brother to this day, he teases me that my favorite show growing up was Statwek <laughs> because I couldn't pronounce my R's. Sure. So um, I, I, again, like yourself, would have been convinced that I am not naturally inclined to learning languages. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you start to step back from your own personal situation and really think about this logically, it doesn't make sense that an individual can be bad at languages. Even somebody with setbacks like a uh, speech impediment or whatever it is, mm -hmm. because we are social animals. We need languages to survive. We have all evolved this skill. And I cannot think of a single person that I've interacted with who or who has sent me a message through my blog who I would say, do you know what? You are a hopeless case. You can't learn foreign <laughs> languages. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. There are people who do indeed have greater challenges to overcome, but absolutely everybody can do this. When you think about your ancestors, there was somebody who had to be bilingual at some stage. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of coming from international countries or countries in like and even in Europe, we small countries are going to intermingle. So somebody had to speak multiple languages. So using the genetics excuse, I don't have the gene for learning languages, is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And when you think mm -hmm. about it, most of the world speaks more than one language. You think of the population of India. You think of in China, where they have to speak different dialects that are effectively as far apart as different European languages are. So sure. most people are multilingual. And it's just a case of when in our isolated bubble of white Westerners, we tend to see only English speakers. And that's very unfortunate because that's not really how the world generally works. And once you see that, you see it's so much more normal and approachable. And it's fine when you throw yourself into it in a non-academic way. Because if, if you treat it academically, every mistake you make is a big red X on your exam paper that brings you closer to that fail grade. Mm -hmm. But when you're actually using it in the real world, every mistake is just you practicing and it is a part of you communicating. And if you say something that is not perfectly grammatically correct, like me want go supermarket, it doesn't matter because the communication has succeeded. The other mm -hmm. person understands what you mean. And if you can try to get 
the gist of the majority of what they say back to you, then you have used the language in a certain degree and you can expand upon that. Makes sense to me. Well, while we're on this topic, let's talk about a couple of the other dirty dozen excuses that people tell themselves of why they can't learn a language. I know with a lot of my private clients, the majority of my private clients are 55, 60, 65, 70 years old. And they always tell me I'm too old. I'm, I'm 65 years old. I'm too old to learn a language. What would you say to something like that? There are loads of examples to the contrary. So I, I've i got my blog. I've got my YouTube channel. There's another guy in the language learning community, Steve Kaufman, who I believe is 80 now. And he is outputting videos of him learning new languages at that age. Amazing. And it's like when you think about it, um, you, you're you really comparing yourself to a child. Like uh, I think the, the question of, you know, I'm too old to learn a language that that excuse doesn't really change if you're 20 or if you're 60. Mm -hmm. It's it's always thinking of, well, the window has passed because I didn't learn it when I was a child. But when I looked into this, I found there was a research done at the University of Haifa that found that under the right circumstances, adults are actually better language learners than children. Mm. The question is those circumstances, because typically an adult will take a dusty old grammar book We'll go to a classroom with, with a bunch of other people and we'll keep our mouth shut while our teacher talks at us. Mm -hmm. Or nowadays we'll use apps that are we're just kind of clicking into them and not actually interacting with the language in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And this is not what children do. Children play games in the language. Children have friends in the language. Children have that necessity to ha actually use that language, which pushes them much more uh, forward than adults who are doing it kind of more casually. So maybe if we can emulate that sense of urgency in our lives, which is why I try to speak with an actual human, mm -hmm. even if I can't travel to the country, I can get someone on a Zoom call, I can start the call, and as long as the rule is no English, I have that pressure that I need to communicate, and it forces me to get out of my comfort zone and expand on things. So... That's kind of addressing the question of why are children better learners? It's because of their approach. Mm -hmm. But like ultimately, adults, there are so many examples. And if somebody does a search on YouTube, um, I have this thing called the Fluent in Three Months Challenge. If you do a search for that, you'll see a lot of people who go through my program upload videos of themselves in various stages of learning. And a lot of the people in my program are 50 and above. And they are successfully learning languages. It's not easy. And I'm sure. not going to give any kind of pipe dream that I have the easy solution to learning a language. It is a pain. You have to feel like an idiot. This takes a lot. Like the biggest learning curve is your ego. Sure. People think it's, it's about the strategy and memorizing words. And to a certain degree, of course it is. But most of what you have to get over is letting go of your ego because as an adult, we are used to communicating in a very deep way all our feelings and our philosophical beliefs or whatever it may be in our mother tongue. And it feels very limiting when we start a new language and we're suddenly asking where the, the bank is. And that's just so, uh, so limiting compared to what we're used to. And so we'll give up because we're like, well, that's a polar opposite to what I can do in my native tongue. So what's the point in even trying? Mm -hmm. And if you have the endurance to push through a period of time where it is difficult and you are not going to be able to communicate very deeply, you can get to the other side. And from that, you can communicate just like everybody else. So there are so many examples of adults learning a language regardless of their age. And like I said, there's research that shows that it's much more about the approach than it is about how, when you were born. Mm -hmm. No, it makes sense to me. I get, so So I have, um, I got a couple of kids and my daughter is seven years old and she speaks native level, English native level, Spanish and native level Mandarin Chinese. And we're working on Russian with her. And everybody, you know, my I bring my kids out for client dinners when it's appropriate and stuff. And the, everybody always says to me, oh, you know, it's because she's a kid and they're little sponges and they just pick up everything. I, I push back on this. And actually, I'm curious your opinion, Benny. I can tell you from, from my daughter, first of all, we homeschool her 
So she's in an environment where she's going to karate in Spanish. My wife is from mainland China. She speaks only Mandarin to her every day. We do, we have um, two nannies who work for us, full-time nannies. They speak only Spanish. So she gets, um, you know, one parent, one language type of things. But on top of that, my daughter at seven years old doesn't have a full-time job. She's not have all these other responsibilities. So basically 14 hours a day are in four different languages split up. And so, and I, I truly believe that if I spent 14 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, for five years straight, trying to learn three additional languages, I'd be pretty awesome at those languages. I think that there's so much of it is, is time and in context and real situations. So I don't, although I think that children are sponges and, and are very impressionable and pick up things, I think we also have to give credit where credit do, is due. And it's the amount of time and energy and effort that the kids can and, and in my case, do put into the language that really um, shows the output of what they're able to do. Yeah, and keep in mind, like, uh, if you're comparing, you, you got you got to compare fairly because a child for the first year of their life is getting exposure to the language and they've nothing to show for it. They're not having conversations when they're one year old. Mm -hmm. I could outdo any baby for any language, <laughs> you know. <Hashtag>. So, <laughs> yeah. So like it, it, people, they make this comparison comparison and they forget that after a few months, you could do so much better. Yep. than any native speaker has ever done after their first few months in a language. But mm -hmm. everything else you said, it it also is very important to remember all of that, that the amount of time they're putting into it. And of course, I would say those are the things that actually make it harder for adults is the fact that we have other responsibilities. Exactly. We have, resp we have families to take care of. We have full-time jobs. We, we have to put only a certain window of time into that language. And I guarantee you, if a child had to deal with some other responsibility and only had two hours a week, then maybe they wouldn't be making that much progress as fast as you would imagine them to be. So the comparison is never very fair. I think people need to be much like easier on themselves Agreed. and realize that you, you have a lot of challenges and those challenges are real. It doesn't mean you can't do this. It just means that it doesn't mean that you're worse than other people. Mm -hmm. uh, other people are lucky. That's them. That's their story. It doesn't matter for you. What matters for you is how can I be slightly better today? Or the, the best way I like to look at it when I'm learning a language is my goal is to suck a little less every day. So it, it, abandon perfectionism sure. and just try to embrace making mistakes, having fun with the language and you're only competing with yourself from yesterday. You're not comparing yourself to other genius language learners. You're not comparing yourself to children who were so lucky that like uh, Mikkel's kids growing up with so many languages in their household, instead of kicking yourself saying, thinking, I wish I could have been that kid, or I wish my family would have spoken to me in my heritage language. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people who've gone through those struggles. But what matters more is what can you do right now and moving forward? Mm -hmm. And there's so much potential that so many people have, if only they would realize it. 100%. Well, any other, you know, big excuses before we move on? Any other big excuses that you hear from people that are like these limited belief patterns that are kind of stopping them from, you know, ever starting to learn a language, a second language? Yeah, and I realize a lot of people listening to this podcast probably are more likely to have the freedom to travel, but I do hear quite a lot. I can't move to the country right now, therefore I can't learn the language. And I, I think this is not a good excuse at all, because like I was saying before, I did move to the country. I moved to Spain, and after six months in Spain, I had nothing to show for it. And it doesn't really matter that I was physically in Spain because I still gravitated towards the English speakers, whether that were fellow native English speakers or Spaniards who wanted to use me to practice their English. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like being in Spain. You, We have this idea that you'll get off the plane, inhale Spanish air and exhale Espanol, you know, yeah. and that's not how the real world works. That's not what immersion is. Immersion is very, very different to being physically in a country that speaks the language. 
And this is why nowadays when I'm preparing to go to a country, I will do the vast majority of my language practice before I go there. I don't really want to be in the country studying and getting language lessons because I may only be there for a few months. So I want to be exploring and traveling, and making friends and such. Mm -hmm. So I do pretty much all of my language learning outside of the country. And there's so many great ways we can do that nowadays. Like I said, from day one, I hire a teacher and they are much more affordable when you're doing it online because you're taking advantage of currency differences and the fact that a teacher in a country like Panama is going to be much more affordable than if I lived in New York or San Francisco and I wanted to get private lessons from someone down the street. There's a, just a world of difference there. And this is why one-on-one -on -one private lessons become realistic. Because we we imagine with our typical budget, you would only be able to join a classroom with a, with a dozen other people and have to share the one native speaker. But I always try to tell people that that you're it doesn't matter about your latitude and your longitude. It matters more about your attitude mm -hmm. when it comes to language learning. Well, I agree with that one as well because I lived in the Middle East for eight years, and I probably know two hundred or three hundred Arabic words in eight years. If I had have really made an effort, I should be fluent in Arabic, but I never made an effort because I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't care. I didn't want to, whatever it was. I didn't prioritize it in my life. I prioritized other things. So I'm not lamenting over that, but I am saying that it is, it's not just, um, you know, learning a language through osmosis, which you, you highlight, you know, I've been a lot more purposeful since I got to Panama four years ago, almost five years ago now, because I really want to learn Spanish and in most situations, I can get by very well and I can have friends and talk to people and have conversation and tell jokes and watch TV and and have a, a decent life here. But I had to be very purposeful about that because I work in English. I'm nine hours a day consulting with clients in Zoom. So I'm not going to get it that way. My wife does the grocery shopping. We've got the nannies who deal with other things. So I had to go out there and get a private teacher and take courses and read books and do all of these types of things. So it had to be a conscious decision on all of it. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit. Okay. So I know that you speak multiple languages. You know, you kind of, you explained the history of German and then learning Spanish or not learning Spanish. What were the things, what were the next languages or what were the kind of the realizations that kind of took you from, you know, a mono, monolingual to now suddenly 10? Like that's that's a huge progression. There has to be a story there. Yeah. So initially I was not going in the direction of being multilingual. I was mainly going in the direction of replacing my active language. So after Spain, I moved to Italy and I was in Italy a while. And after my time there, my Italian was starting to get pretty good, but I was forgetting my Spanish. Mm. And then I moved to France and I lived in France for a year. And the same thing happened. I was losing my Spanish, losing my Italian and only able to speak French. And when it finally came time to move to Brazil, I decided this time I really want to do it differently because I put so much time and effort into these languages and it felt like such a waste. It's never a waste. Like if somebody spoke a language at one stage in their life, you can always reactivate it. So ne never think about that time as being wasted. It's just more laying dormant in your mind. So what I've done differently ever since then is I have made sure that I gravitate towards a life that enables multilingualism. Okay. So in Brazil, I went out of my way to make sure I went to international events that I was going to be mingling with people who spoke things other than just the Port Portuguese that I was learning at the time. And back then, ages ago, um, a great resource was Couchsurfing. It's not so important nowadays, but back then it was a fantastic uh, way. I remember to meet. it. <laughs> I was yeah, an ambassador for Couchsurfing and I had like over a hundred people stay at my place when I lived in Australia. And I, I had loved it over 2,000 people stay at my various what? places over the oh world. Oh my God. 2,000. <laughs> and I used Couchsurfing as a means of practicing language. Like I would I would go out of my way to host non-English speakers. So that was part that was part of like still part of the same solution of how my practicing languages, like when I moved to Amsterdam and I was learning Dutch, I remember hosting this lady from Quebec for several days and I was only speaking French with her. 
Mm-hmm. So this meant I was actively using the language. Nowadays, uh, the, the the global landscape has changed a lot in terms of the resources I can use. But as an example of how I would typically get practice in multiple languages these days, what I think about what am I naturally going to do with my time? And nowadays, I'm like many people, I like scrolling on TikTok. You know, it's a great way of winding down my day. But it's not a very productive use of my time sure. when I'm watching cat and dog videos. So what I've done is I've created different social media accounts in all of the social media that I use. So I have 15 TikTok accounts, 15 Instagram accounts, 15 X or Twitter accounts, and 15 YouTube accounts. And in each one of those, I don't use every single one every day. I generally am only juggling maybe three or four languages at a time and which three or four changes depending on where I am. Like right now, I'm spending a while in Spain. So not just Spanish, but Catalan has become a much more active language for me. I'm going to be visiting Andorra, Andorra where they speak Catalan. So I'm, I'm kind of preparing for that. And so I switch into those accounts. And the reason I have separate accounts is because I can train the algorithm to only show me content in that language. I can follow the right hashtags. I can follow accounts that I know are posting only in that language. On the likes of Instagram, I will do uh, use their map feature, search for places um, like bars and restaurants, and just see the stories people are sharing there. And that's people I can follow and just see what you know, r- random normal people are doing who live in the country or the city that has like the dialect that I want to be practicing. And so nowadays, that's one way that I'm getting lots of language practice. Of course, there's loads of other things you can do. If you watch lots of Netflix, you know, you can change the language on Netflix and have a dub to so many different languages. Same with Disney+. Plus. A lot of the, the dubs are very well done that they even like sing the songs very well in the other languages if it's a musical mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. movie or whatever. So there's like nowadays there are so many things I could not do when I started traveling 20 years ago. I even changed the interface of my phone and I learn a few less common languages. Like in Ireland, we have the Irish language, uh, which is obviously not as strong as a lot of other major languages in the world. But I can change my, because I have an Android phone, I can change my interface on my phone to be entirely in the Irish language. I can also change it to be Esperanto. I can change Mm -hmm. my operating system on my computer if I switch to Linux. I can have that also in Esperanto or Irish. But of course, you know, if you use one of the um, Windows and and Mac, you can change those to the uh, biggest languages uh, very quickly as well. So like there are so many ways that you can get at this exposure. And this is why I was saying before that where you are does not determine your immersion. Mm -hmm. And I try to make a sense of virtual immersion. Even when I'm not in the country, I can create my, I can guide my environment such that it is helping me to absorb and get exposure to just the one language that I want. I can be listening to live streamed radio whenever I'm working out from that country. So I'm listening to the right pop songs, I'm listening to interviews and whatever it is. So every aspect of what I'm doing, I can get exposure to the language. But of course, the center of gravity for all of this for me has to be humans. Mm -hmm. I have to be speaking it with somebody. So I'm maintaining contact with the friends that I've made in the countries that I've gone to, even if that's just a few WhatsApp messages every now and again. Or I'm, of course, trying to do video calls to have actual live conversations so that I don't get rusty in my languages. So actively using them has been its own skill that I've had to learn. And that's how now I can switch between the languages without losing them. Um, And it's a kind of, uh, I switch between two different stages. I am either 100% devoted to learning one new language. So this year, for instance, I was learning Korean in uh, like ahead of there and then going and living in South Korea. Um, and that was the only language I was worried about. And everything I did was in or through that language. Now I'm not learning a new language. I'm in maintenance mode. So mm-hmm. I'm maintaining my Spanish, my Catalan, my French, my Portuguese, because these are the languages I know I'm definitely using in the next few months. 
and I will switch to other languages that I've been less active in whenever the time comes for those. So it's a, it's a case of spinning plates all the time. And I have to accept that some might kind of get slipped down and fall and I have to work to get them back up again. Um, so I can't maintain high levels in a high number of languages, but I know I can revisit and then bring that language back on a pedestal and make that one of my more active languages. So it is a bit of a juggling act to be a polyglot, uh, but I enjoy it. And I enjoy the fact that I can reactivate these languages. And then when I'm ready for it, I accept that there will be period of time, uh, per- periods of time that I'm, a- I'm intensively learning a new language and my all my other languages might have to get slightly rusty because of the, the lack of focus. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. And that's why I can add a new language to the mix. And I think w- one of my best uh, talents out of all of this is not language learning. It's that I am not a perfectionist. And I think that is the biggest hurdle a lot of people have to work through. If you are a perfectionist, this is something you need to unlearn or or have some way of dealing with when it comes to learning a language, because you need to accept that that perfectionism is not realistic. So I accept that I'm going to lose a certain amount of level in these languages I'm not maintaining. I accept that I can never reach pure perfection. And I, I always try to remind myself that this is the case even for my mother tongue. My my ex was American and both spoke both of us spoke English. And I remember once she mentioned something about a wife beater. And I was like, a wife, I would never do such a thing. And she was talking about a vest that you wear under your shirt. I'd never heard wife beater before. That, that's an American term. We don't have that in Ireland. Yeah. And so does that mean that I do I can I can therefore say my English wasn't good enough? Of course not just means there was uh, there's always more to learn if there's more to learn for me in my native language then obviously i should go less hard on myself when it comes to my target languages Mm -hmm. it's very interesting going back to your point about netflix and disney plus and things like that um my daughter i would say like using your scale is in the maintenance on english chinese and spanish because she's really at incredible levels on those. I mean, we're working on her reading and writing in all three of the languages because she's seven. But Russian is the language that we're trying to actively help her to learn. But right now, since the the war, it getting Russian content is so much more difficult. You can go on, say, Disney Plus and find a, a movie or a program or something like that. And it'll be in Finnish and in in Indonesian, and it'll be in uh, Urdu, but it won't be in Russian. And I'm like, that is that is politics. I mean, you're they're even bringing politics into kids programming. It's it's unbelievable, um, you know, how they're trying to censor these types of things. And it's just I just find that mind boggling. I, I don't I, I don't know anything about that. I don't know if it may may be political. It may just be because of the the standards of dubbing and how that works with Russian. I don't know if maybe you remember. The I reckon same it's programs. definitely in. I think it's definitely a political thing because if they've got thirty different languages, like we chose Russian because we thought it was going to be one of the best languages for her to learn to open up a new part of the world to communicate with. Because okay, English, Chinese, and Spanish—that's already a massive amount. We lived in the Middle East, and we could have had her learn Arabic as her next language. We 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 believe, and I still believe, that she'll have more opportunities in Latin America uh, as a female than in, in learning Arabic. Um, like we lived in the UAE, so you could get by with English perfectly well. I lived and worked there for almost a decade. Um, and then we know that she'll learn Brazilian Portuguese because as you and I were discussing before, my son is Brazilian and we'll go back there and live at some point again. So she'll pick that up. So kind of like thinking about, well, what are the other languages? What she, what could she do? And Russian seemed to me to be a very, uh, natural choice to open up a larger portion of, of the planet. Um, and it was fine for the first couple of years. And now since this war, getting content in Russian has become so much more difficult. So I think it's a concerted effort. Well, then how about this? How, if it is a concerted effort and there is politics behind this, keep in mind, there are also politics behind uh, helping other languages. 
So on because of the global stage of, of how Russia is viewed, what's happened is the Ukrainian language has completely exploded in terms of how it's available. And obviously, it's not as powerful a language as Russian, but Ukrainian and Russian are something along the lines of like Spanish and Portuguese. So if you were to speak Ukrainian fluently, then it would not be that big of a leap to switch towards Russian. Uh, so like if these platforms are do have politics behind them, then they are likely going to actually have Ukrainian if they are actively putting down Russian. So that's maybe that's a that, point. Yeah, that's a direction you could go in. You that's know? a good tip. Let me. I'm going to definitely look into that because I never uh, that one did not occur to me. So I'm going to definitely look into that. But it's just kind of funny when you start looking at languages around the world and how they, um, you know, between mainstream media and big conglomerates, can be pushed in different directions. But um, Back to your story. So you were l- working on Korean, you've worked on these other languages. Do you think that you will learn more languages in the future? Do you have plans to continue this journey or you think you're going to kind of go with this maintenance mode throughout the rest of your languages? Well, I have gone through uh, like various peaks and troughs in my travels and language learning. And I've just come from a very long stretch of being in an English speaking country for many years in the States. Um, So I'm now back into feeling a bit more energized to want to get into language learning mode, Mm -hmm. which is why I dove into Korean this year. Uh, But I just wrapped that project up like a month or two ago. So for probably the next year, I'll be in maintenance mode. I'll probably be in South America for most of the next year both um, improving upon my Portuguese and because of the nature of the kind of travel, I really want to travel deep. And the theme of my travels is to visit every state or province of a country that I spend significant time in. So in the States, I've been to 44 states. In South Korea, I visited every province and every metropolitan area. Um, And in Brazil, there are 26 states. I've been to 13 of them. And I want to continue those travels. And the way that overlaps with languages is, of course, each state has its own unique dialect. Mm-hmm. And be- once you, get, you, I always tell people, don't worry about dialects when you're getting started. It's really not a good use of your energy to be concerning yourself about differences between Mexican Spanish and other Spanishes when it's your first couple of weeks learning the language. It doesn't really matter for, for you as a learner at that stage. But when you're at the mastery level, like I am in my better languages, now I care a lot more about those dialects. So I'm going to dive a lot into that in Brazilian Portuguese. And then there's several Latin American countries I've not visited yet where obviously they would speak Spanish and I would investigate those dialects. Well, we were just down in Uruguay and in Paraguay over the last couple of weeks. This is multiple trips down to Uruguay. And talk about, um, I, I guess it was not dialects, but it's accents. I found incredibly difficult, even after three times of visiting um, Uruguay, uh, their differences in the language to here in Panama, I felt like I didn't even speak Spanish. It took me a couple of days to to understand. Like they were always saying, ah, I, like basically, shuvia, like it's going to rain. And I'm like, shuvia, shuvia, or plaja, plaja. Okay, vamos a la plaja. Pleasure. And then we figured out, oh, it's Yuvia and Playa. Like we we do this very strong double L type of sound here in Panama. And I literally I couldn't follow along with the conversations for the first three or four days of the trip. But once I, I heard it and I identified it, ah, okay, now I understand the difference in the pronunciation and things started to click for me again. And I'd say that was probably three or four days of a seven day trip, I was able to kind of transfer over. So it can happen very fast, I think. Oh, absolutely. And this is one reason why I avoid perfectionism, because I think one of the temptations of that mentality is that you start to have an idea in your mind of how a language should sound. Mm -hmm. And because I don't put a language on a pedestal and I don't think you know, Spanish is this perfect language that must follow this particular procedure. I'm accepting when I when I'm learning Spanish here in Spain 
that it has a particular way that it works here in Spain. But like you said, in countries like Panama and then all the way down in Uruguay, things are going to be completely different. And that for me is an interesting part of it, especially when you really dive into it and you start to see the reasons behind these. Like in Argentine Spanish, there's so much of an influence of Italian. And you, when you know a little Italian, that helps you with vocabulary and how they use slightly different words. And even understanding the history of the conjugation, like in Uruguay and Argentina and in other countries like Colombia, they use the bos conjugation when they're speaking, um, instead of using tu, they use bos. And this is a great analogy with English for thou. And whenever you watch these old shows in Spain that depict how people existed in Shakespearean times, they actually say they actually use the word boss like Spaniards use it to show the same way we would with a Shakespearean play using thou art. So um, I find that stuff absolutely fascinating. And when you look at it that way, rather than thinking this is a brick wall preventing me from understanding Spanish, more go in with wide eyed, like enthusiasm and think, you know, this is so interesting that they change the way the word sound. Doesn't that sound so pleasant that they have this je sound like a like a French je sound uh, for for their double L's? And you go in with that attitude, and everything completely transforms. So um, there's a lot of ways to find dialects so much more interesting, and this is something I always try to do. Makes sense to me. And it's interesting too, your goal of visiting every state. One of my goals that I've had since I was a teenager is to go to every country in the world. And I'm at something like over 110 countries. I got to recount at some point, but it's been 23 years of continual travel trying to visit these places. And this year in 2023, I've been to eight new countries and that was super exciting for me. And it's cool to kind of have these goals and use it as a way to to learn about the culture and the history and things like that. But I do the same thing in not necessarily on the languages, but trying to understand the place and the people and the history and the culture before visiting it. So that when I go there, I actually have a richer experience because I already have some context and some background in it. Exactly. Yeah. So the majority of our listeners on this program, I would guess, are either thinking about uh, a Latin American country as in a Spanish speaking country or a Brazilian Portuguese country. I don't think I have a lot of people who are going to move to, to Korea or anything like that, even though it actually is one of my favorite countries in the world. For most of my people, it's probably just not a country they're going to go to. So let's do a, a hypothetical situation. Someone decides that in 2024, they want to move to a Latino country. You know, they listen to our episode today. They already understand what we were talking about before, about these false belief patterns, and they understand that they can learn a language. What are the three to five to however many, you know, tips or tricks or strategies or, you know, things that they should do to get ready to, to go to one of these countries to move to? Well, uh, for the first thing is that concept of getting ready. I would kind of put that aside because okay. I think the idea of you will be ready uh, is is a, a little bit of a damaging concept because that implies that there's, there's a, a certain level you're going to reach. And when you're at that level, everything is great. I, I would try to uh, nudge people towards uh, a much more nebulous idea of the language that you are going to be communicating and that communication skill is going to improve with time. But there's no way, like 20, whether it's 2024 or 2034, there's no way you can have an end goal that when you reach that goal, your Spanish will be perfect. Mm -hmm. That's just not going to happen. And I think it's very freeing to let go of that. So if somebody decides I'm going to move to that country, that don't like don't be thinking about when you're ready because the temptation there is to go into study mode. I'm going to study for the next six months and then I'll be ready to start actually speaking Spanish. And I always give the analogy of like riding a bike. Imagine if we lived in a world where people, when they wanted to ride bikes, they decided I'm going to study aerodynamics. 
and I'm going to study trigonometry to know exactly how many degrees to turn the angle of a handlebar. And I'm going to study all these things. And then in a year's time, I'll finally be ready to put my ass on a saddle and start pedaling. That's obviously a very ridiculous idea because we all know you just got to do it. You got to you know, you'll slip, you'll fall. Maybe you need to use some stabilizers to keep you steady at first, but you have to actually ride that bike. So I would tell people, even if you're deciding I'm going to move to a Latin country in 2024, today is the day you're making the decision. So book a session with a language teacher. There are a couple of sites that I like. One is italki, I-T-A-L-K-I. Another is Preply. P-R-E-P-Y, P-L-Y. And these are two sites that you can get connected with um, directly with the teachers and hire them and just book as many sessions as you possibly can immediately. Like if you want to give yourself some running time, give yourself a couple of days, but don't decide, you know, in a month I'll be ready because that's not going to work. So let go of the ready idea and just decide I'm going to speak this language now so that when the time comes and I arrive in the country, it's not that I'm going to be ready. It's that I'm going to hit the ground running and I'm going to already have momentum and I'm going to be speaking a lot better than I would have had I waited. And there's so many things that you can do around that. Uh, And people are always asking me what's my favorite app and my favorite book and so on. But those questions are not as important as you would think they are. It's really just about, are you speaking that language? If you're speaking it, everything else you need to do is geared around making those spoken sessions better. So maybe your teacher is giving you homework. Maybe your teacher has favorite materials that they think you should be using. And maybe you'll decide, I'll do some research and, and I'll find some courses that guide me along this. I've created courses. Obviously, I recommend people use them, but I'm not going to say that you must buy my course. I would always tell people you must speak with a human. That is your greatest resource of all. Make that your priority. And when you go to the country, you'll already be able to communicate with people. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. Because I went through italki and I had an amazing experience. Actually, if you guys go to expatmoneyshow.com forward slash italki, italki, you guys will be able to get some free credit on there. I've done probably close to 400 hours of Spanish on italki. And I think the prices were usually between six and nine dollars US for an hour with a, um, a native speaker. And these weren't like structured lessons. These were just conversations. So we talk about our day and our family and all these things. And my one Spanish teacher, she's from Guatemala. She ended up becoming a super dear friend of ours. And she even flew to Panama with her husband and and their their child to come for my birthday party in March. So if you guys came to my birthday party here in Panama, you had a chance to meet her. So you can have like really great friendships that you can build with someone. and. You know, I built that entire relationship in Spanish with her. We pretty much never spoke in English together, even though she speaks English. And it's just an amazing experience. I, I'm a big, big fan of these types of language marketplaces, like you mentioned. So those are two excellent ones that you had mentioned, you know, is the the pre-framing of the idea and, and being mentally prepared and then going into uh, some type of a, a, a one-on-one language marketplace, like we mentioned, italki. Um, and then I guess the courses kind of come afterwards. So maybe three points. Anything else that people should kind of keep in their brain as they're going through this journey? Uh, there are many things, but I think it it does have to be this personal journey of letting go of your ego and just making those mistakes. And keeping that mentality in mind that each day, like I I have this goal when I'm in intensive learning mode, rather than avoid mistakes, I think to myself today, I'm going to go out of my way to make at least 200 mistakes. (laughs) And that change in mentality completely flips the table and allows me to start communicating. But like I said, you can do loads of other things. So just think about how do you enjoy your life? Do you like watching Netflix? Do you like flicking around on TikTok and then think, can I do these things 
in my target language. And nowadays, more and more, there are ways that we can uh, have this immersion in our life. So try to fill your life up with that language and make it a part of of your world. And ideally, you can do like what you did and make friends in the language. And that'll completely transform your experience. So before we pushed record, Benny, you and I were talking about some of the countries that we really like. You know, you lived in Brazil. Brazil is one of my favorite countries in the world. I've got a dozen Brazilian employees who work for me. I love the music and the culture and the food there is just incredible. Talk to us about some of the other places that you visited in the world that you just absolutely fell in love with. I mean, you've been traveling for a long time, so you've had a ton of experience. I'm super curious what countries you that speak to you. Uh, absolutely. Brazil is, is by far my favorite country for a lot of reasons. Um, but in general, I, I do like to see what are the positives I can take from each country. Uh, it's very easy to get focused on the negatives when you're when you're there. But I, I my whole mentality has been to see what are the interesting, unique aspects of every place that I go to. So even countries that I've had a difficult time in. I'm always trying to see how can this country stand out? So even in a country like the States, which were actually some of my more difficult years, I went through a lot of personal problems while I was there. There are a lot of things that I enjoy about about America and that I look forward to whenever I go back. And now that I'm back in Europe, there are so many things that just work and they're so straightforward that I miss so much just the, how how delicious a simple espresso is and how the bread tastes amazing. And like bread in a lot of countries is not really that appetizing, but here in Spain and in France, I could have just bread and be happy. <laughs> and like, I I think about how people interact with each other and how uh, great the family relationships are. And I was very lucky when I was in Italy once to have the opportunity to have an Easter dinner with four generations of Italians and to experience that for myself was just like, because of my language, because of Italian, I was able to have that experience. So for me, the travel lifestyle is absolutely not about comfort. And I go in with as few stereotypes as possible. And I think if you go in thinking the country must work like this, I have a certain idea of how friendly people must be or like there's not going to be any problems. I go in with a bit of skepticism and always trying to be a little bit defensive in terms of not having my stuff stolen, which is why in over 20 years, the only time I had something stolen for me was in the United States. So when people talk to me about dangerous countries, I, I have a very direct answer for them on that one. Mm -hmm. um, but like uh, it's... For me, it's about giving myself a breadth of experience in life. And each country has something completely different that it can offer. And even the negatives are something that can I can take with me to appreciate something that I didn't even realize that I missed when I was in other countries. Yeah, 100%. You know, I have so many clients who think that we're looking for like the perfect country or even that I traveled to try to find the perfect country. And I'm like, no, I travel because I like differences. I like to, to see and experience and, 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 and I try to appreciate whatever that country has to offer. Like people say, Oh, well, what's your least favorite country? I mean, the, the, the obvious question is what's your favorite country, but the other obvious one is like, which one's your least favorite. I've never been to a bad country. And I mean, I've been to, countries that most people will never, ever, ever go to in their life. But because I'm focused on the things that are exciting and new and different and challenges and how that's going to shape me as a human being and what I can give back, I've never been to like a bad place. I also know that in every country I've been to, as I said, well over 110 countries, you know, people are pretty much the same. Like they want the same things. They want a roof over their head. They want to take care of their family. They want to be loved. They want a full belly. That stuff is is human. So it doesn't matter if it's a place in Africa or Asia or Latin America. That connects all of us. And even if there's bad politics in a country or bad government, that doesn't necessarily, rec you know, reflect the entire population of that country. Like even when I went to North Korea, like North Korea, I still met 
the most, some beautiful, beautiful people there and sat down with them in the sunny day in Pyongyang and had picnic with them and chatted with them and talked with them and learned about their lives. And they were super curious about us in North Korea. But I mean, if you watch mainstream media, it's like everybody in the country is evil and bad and wrong. And it's like, no, humans want the same things. So I totally um, understand your point of the attitude of going in with an open mind and trying to, to learn things from the people. And it's the experiences that really matter. Absolutely. Well, you know, both of us really love Brazil and, you know, some of the other countries that really speak to me is I'm in Panama. I, I think Panama is an amazing country. I'm super bullish on the place. Another place is Colombia. I had some of my best experiences in my life in Medellin and traveling around Bogota and Cali and Cartagena and all of these places in Colombia. What's maybe some other places in the world, maybe in Latin America that really spoke to you? I am really looking forward to expanding my experience in Latin America, but I've personally been in Argentina for three months and uh, I took advantage of the currency difference there and I got a private world-class tango instructor to teach me. Uh, so th that was actually my first ever time truly taking advantage of being a digital nomad because I had just started working as an online translator. This was way back in 2005. Mm. So like I was the only person working online uh, essentially at the time. Um, and I, I just find the language part so interesting. And I was really diving into how Argentine Spanish works differently. And I also spent time in Peru. And Peru, of course, has the its own language, Quechua. And that was so interesting because it's uh, it's like nothing like any other European language. They will still write with Latin letters. So at least there's uh, that lower barrier to get into it. But then I'd find all these random little things that just happen to coincidentally be the same as like a, a, a term they have in Polish for asking questions. They had the same thing in Quechua. And there's no way these two countries influenced each other. And I learned enough Quechua to actually do a part of the Inca Trail through Quechua. And the, that for me just completely transformed the experience because a lot of people would go to South America to learn Spanish, but I was in South America to mm -hmm. learn Quechua through Spanish. So like it was uh, completely different to what they were expecting. And of course, I've been in Colombia and I one way I like to get into the culture is through dance. I am such a big fan of dance. So like I said, I did the tango in Argentina. I did salsa in Colombia and salsa caleña that had these little kicks to it as well. Um, and I just spent the year in Korea learning K-pop dance lessons. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so like, and of course, all these lessons are in the language. So it's sure. a kind of a, a mixed bag that I get to uh, experience the culture, but also I'm sharing a passion and this has been a great way for me to make friends because those dance lessons, obviously I, I care about the dance so much and I'm with other people who share that passion. And after the dance lesson ends, I'll get to talk to those people. And because I be a bit more open and, you know, especially in a Latin American country, you're more likely to have couples dancing. It'd be a great chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with people. So um, like, really diving in and embracing that side of things. And when I first arrived in the likes of Colombia and my salsa was absolutely abysmal, I would be stressed that people would be making fun of me and laughing at me, but everyone was super encouraging. They were so, so nice. And they, they find it so amazing that a foreigner wants to learn this aspect of their culture because they're a, a lot of these countries do have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder that they're worried that the the rest of the western world looks down on them as just a poor country with nothing to give and when you really try to dive into that culture like when i'm in brazil and i talk about things that are not the more typical things like football and samba when i talk about like really deep parts of the culture that foreigners don't tend to see their eyes light up and they they feel a sense of pride in their own country that i'm helping ignite and 
It's why if I'm making content about the the country, making TikToks or YouTube videos, I'm always trying to think what are the interesting, cool things about this country that like maybe the locals are starting to forget to appreciate. Maybe they don't realize those they don't exist in other countries. Like in Brazil, people are so hygienic. And that, that's not a that's not your immediate stereotype of Brazil, but Brazilians will shower twice a day. And when you visit a Brazilian friend, the first thing they'll say to you when you arrive in their in their house is, do you want to have a shower? Because that's just their first natural thought. And like they have the extra towels on hand and everything just because it's so expected to be so clean. And that completely flips the idea that, oh, it's just this poor third world country, because there are a lot of things I think that a lot of South Americans do better than the rest of us. And when you start to appreciate those things, you miss them when you go back to other countries. So that sense of like joining in and especially the dance culture and that you can have music on the street and all of the different kinds of food and the many different traditions that they have. These are the things that just light me up and I'm so excited. I'm really pleased I'm going to get to spend most of 2024 experiencing all of this again. Yeah, I think back to one of my trips to Colombia. And the first time I went to Colombia was back in 2003. And I've been back since. And, you know, Colombia doesn't have a really great past. You know, there's some really dark things that happened in the country. But actually, if you go there and you meet Colombians, they're some of the most warm, incredible human beings on planet Earth. And they really want to showcase how gorgeous their country is. Like they have so much to offer. And through that, like, they go out of their way to to really help you understand. And they're so thrilled that you are, are taking a, a chance, quote unquote, on coming to their country. And even if you don't speak the language perfectly, going back to our previous conversation, any effort you make is just so amazing. I remember one time I was trying to get back to the Candelaria, La Candelaria, a district in Bogota where my, my youth hostel was. And I was completely lost. And I asked some older gentleman and he, instead of just telling me which bus route to take, he got on the bus with me, took me all the way there, then took me out for coffee, paid for our coffee. We sat and spoke for an hour or something like that. And then walked me to my hostel and then turned around and walked back the way he had came from. Like he just, he went so out of his way and it's 20 years. And I still remember that experience by going to a country. I just think it's, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, Benny, thank you so much for today's conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. If my listeners want to get a hold of you, if they want to check out your blog or pick up your book, where can we send them? Well, since people are in podcast listening mode right now, the most direct way they can find me is by in the same podcast app they're in right now, search for language hacking. I run a podcast show called the language hacking show and this is me sometimes interviewing people, but very often giving a very quick burst of advice for some aspect of learning a language. That's the first place people should go. And then the next place is, of course, fluentin3months.com. If you check that out, that's my site that has all of my best tips. I got loads of articles there. I've got links to my favorite resources, whether these are things you can buy or free websites that you can access. And I have loads of articles that are about every aspect of learning the language. I published a bunch of books. So if you're in your local bookshop, just look for Fluent in Three Months or Language Hacking. I've made courses for Spanish, French, Italian, German, and Mandarin. And you'll find them with a big picture of my face on the cover. <laughs> um, and of course, I'm on social media. Like I said, I got a, a lot of channels on social media, but you can break the breaking off point would be. Irish polyglot. That's what I am on all of my main English channels across those. Um, and then I guess the, uh, if your listeners are following the biggest next one will be Spanish. And for that one, my handle is Irlande Sastre, <laughs> which is uh, an amalgamation of, of Irishman and disaster. And disaster. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Benny, thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Take it easy.